My name is Jordan Pearson. I'm from Torbay in Devon. I've been a youth worker, I've been a support worker, and I've even ran my own community centre. And throughout those journeys, I've met so many ordinarily kind people that don't get the recognition that they deserve. So this is my attempt to recognise them. I think kindness is within all of us. It costs nothing to be kind, but it probably means the most. We're looking for kind people that are passionate about what they do and really trying to make a huge difference in their community. These people are the backbone of our society, giving one thing that you can't get more of, their time. In this series, my friend Rach from Part-Time Working Mummy joins me as we travel up and down the country in our search for ordinary kindness. This week, we've come to the north of England, in Chester, to visit Crossroads Community Hub. We're here to find out how they responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, when people found themselves in dire need for food as they were forced to stay at home. You'll see just what's possible when people are willing to give up their time with a single goal of helping others. This was a church, it's a redundant church, so it was closed down a couple of years ago. But the owners of it have given us free use of it during the crisis, so that we could run this food distribution hub. And then we've renamed it Crossroads Community Hub. Yes, yeah, so I'm Adam Langan, one of the local councillors for Newton and Hall. I actually live about 20 doors down from this building, which makes it convenient. And my granddad was vicar here for 70 years, which is why we can obviously have access to the building as a whole and got a nice special connection to it. So it all started um, because I worked full time and I was actually furloughed for a few weeks at the start of the very first lockdown, which was actually quite nice because being a counsellor, it's hard to be proactive with things when you're working. So to actually have that time to go out and start things was really important. And so I met with someone called Stephanie Ellis, who works for Welcome Network, which is a food-based charity in Chester. And we were talking about food bank provision and how to sort of make it better because just because you can't afford food doesn't mean you should just get the basic spam, beans, that sort of stuff. So we built it on an ethos of trying to reach a point where we have a gold standard of food bank parcels, so fresh fruit and vegetables, chocolate, treats, that sort of thing, bread, cheese, and tailor it to what people want, what they like, what they're allergic to, dietary needs if they've got pets, toiletries, all this sort of stuff that adds up and costs money. But you wouldn't necessarily in a traditional food bank parcel get it. So we partnered up with West Cheshire Food Bank who gave us, who have been brilliant, who gave us the sort of standard food and we can add value and build on that with all the other various community groups and organisations we've been working with. So for me, the first thing I noticed when we came in and had a nosy round is um, there's a poster there and it's like your bags A, B and C. Yes. And for C, it says families with either a kettle and if they have a microwave, we'll let you know. Yes. So they've got no cooking facilities yes. and I instantly nearly burst into tears yes. because the thought of my children go at growing with just a microwave and a, and a kettle how do you cope with that? Because I would really struggle. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a good point. I, I do. I mean, I, I must admit, when I when I first started, there were some stories that I heard that, yeah, you you can't not get get choked up and get upset because it's you do sort of imagine yourself, your own family in that situation. Um, but I think part of the reason why we have that ABC system is so that we can cater to each individual family so that you don't give you know um, pot noodles and something that maybe they wouldn't enjoy pot noodles maybe they've got a kitchen and they can feed their family with fresh fruit and veg and pasta um, but if they are um, in a hotel room and all they have is a kettle then sometimes instant noodles and instant pasta are the best things we can give um, now that doesn't mean that there's no hope and that's where it stays, you know, there's schemes that are looking to help people who have been homeless and put in hotels get housing, so part of what my job is is to network with other organisations, for example Sanctuary Housing, um, who look at housing people who were homeless. Um, so then they can move into somewhere with a kitchen, they don't have to have the C boxes anymore, but um, for the people who unfortunately do, at least there's a way to make it specific to them. We've tried really hard on making sure that of that food, like pot noodles and the pasta stuff that you just hot, add hot water to, there is variety of it. So you're not just having six B 
beef and mushroom, six, chicken, pot noodle, you've got variety of that sort of stuff. You throw in some apples, you throw in some bread and cheese, you throw in some chocolate and suddenly they're in, it's a much nicer food parcel rather than just like your standard stuff like that. Although, to be honest, it's, it's really hard and people living in that situation can't have nutritious meals, just the way the circumstances are. Um, you said you had six kids. One of the people we helped was a, I obviously can't give you details, but was a lady who was fleeing domestic violence. She had six kids across two hotel rooms. Can you imagine the chaos? It was during Easter though, and we had a long discussion over whether to give them different flavored Easter eggs, and then they argue over which one they prefer. So we ended up giving them six like buttons because it's safe, safest option, isn't it? Yeah, that would be. And you'll know with yeah, six yeah, kids. The, yeah, we didn't want to. We didn't want to give any more stress to the mum, to be honest. Yeah, I would say that the hardest part is yeah coming to grips with the realities of what people are dealing with, and knowing that for me this is a job, and I come here and I speak to these people on the phone, and I sort of you have to be quite you have to be quite matter of fact and, and know that you've got to get these parcels delivered. But that's their life, you know, it's it's not just information. Yeah. It's a person's reality. And yeah, I remember I remember around Christmas time, um, I'd only been in the job for, you know, just under a month. And I did I did speak to a woman who very, very tragically had been the victim of domestic abuse and she um, specifically asked for a, a female driver so that she yeah. could physically open the door um, to receive her parcel and she had a child who she couldn't afford Christmas gifts for and so um, very very luckily we had someone donated some children's toys they said oh look I don't know what to do with them I don't know where like the nearest charity shop is can you take them and I said yeah sure I'll probably come in useful and then I, I was on the phone to her and I said um, look, I don't know if this is going to be relevant, but we've got like a toy digger and we've got some books and stuff. Is that useful? And she broke down and yeah. said, oh, well, that would just make my year. So we gave them to her as well. And yeah, that was that's probably double-sided coin. That was like a really nice moment yeah. and really sad at the same time. But I think they, when they come together, it just yeah. makes, you, makes you get up and want to come and do it again, oh, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Chester is known to be quite an affluent part of the UK. But as you have heard, many families really struggled with the lockdown and many continue to do so. Whilst the government provided financial support for most, the more drastically affected relied on people like Karen and Helen not to go hungry. So for people that don't have kettles, for example, we might, um, you might think, well, let's give them things like tuna and sweet corn that they can open cans, yep. mix together. Yep. Doesn't need cooking. It doesn't need cooking. So you try and, you know, things like potatoes, potentially you could have those cold. Yep. There's instant mash, yep. maybe you could have that. So you try and think of things that actually you might give them do. like you might give them beans, but you probably wouldn't give them cold yeah. hula hoops type. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spaghetti hoops. Spaghetti hoops. I don't yeah. know why, but maybe cold beans aren't quite as quite as bad. offensive. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Upon arrival, the donations get organised into a simple routing system. And then to fulfill an order, it's just one lap of the hole to fill up the boxes for each recipient or family. They try their best to meet all dietary requirements and make sure that the food is appropriate for the user's cooking facilities. A B group, we've got different categories. So this, a B is a couple or family that have full cooking facilities, so they could have microwave, but they've definitely got a cooker, kettle, stuff like that. So I've got two adults, two children, aged 13 and 11, and they've specifically asked for jam, hot chocolate and peas. So I can put in other things as well. Sometimes there'll be stuff that they don't want, but there's nothing on there. If people want to donate, what are the things that are really useful and really good and what other things are not so good? So I think some of the things that people think are really useful sometimes just aren't because, as you can imagine, everybody has the same idea about what's useful. So, for example, at the minute, we have loads and loads of baked beans, loads and loads of pasta, loads and loads of tea, and so we won't need any of that donated for a long time. And I know that West Cheshire Food Bank, um, who are the, the sort of the governing body who, who give us the, um, a lot of the basic food that we need to make up the parcels, they all experience the same thing. Um, so it is really important to get the message out of what is actually useful. And, and for that, I would say 
it, it does vary depending on what people feel like giving, you know, the time of year. But in general, it's really good to bear in mind um, things like hot chocolate. So people, you know, it's nice to have a drink that's just not that's not tea or coffee. If you don't like tea or coffee or if you've got children. Um, so hot chocolate's a really good one. Something that people don't often think about is jam. Um, jam and marmalades and lemon curd or anything like that to put on toast, especially if someone doesn't have um, cooking facilities, um, it'll give them things that they can make sandwiches with, which probably form um, a lot more meals um, than other people might have. Um, also, just thinking about cooking facilities as well. Um, so rehydratable alternatives of stuff is really good. So custard, you can obviously heat up in the microwave or on a hob, but if someone doesn't have that, packet custard can be just as good. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to give um, people like puddings and things to look forward to after their meals rather than just biscuits and packets and stuff. Um, so for that, I would also say things like this. So cakes in boxes, Mr. Kipling's are great. Swiss rolls, um, you know, people don't need to worry about them getting crushed and stuff because there's plenty of space to store them. Um, so that is a good, that would be good. Um, things like this, again, so you can get canned soup, but you can also get a rehydratable soup, which is which is really nice and comforting as well. Um, similarly with these, so there's loads of packet pasta that you put in a pan, but not many of these bachelors um, mac and cheese sauces. There's like mushroom and chicken ones as well, and that's custard. Um, <laughs> And yeah, stuff like this. And then finally, I would say UHT milk because it's an absolute necessity. Um, and it's something that we've run out of a few times. And so UHT milk will always be on the list. To be honest, I, I hate food banks. <laughs> I think it's a failure of society that they even exist. I think um, you're gonna, like I will celebrate the day this closes because if there's not a need for it, then fantastic, that's, that's amazing. But it's good to be able to provide a service for people who do need it. There's a lot of people at the moment, especially who, say if you're furloughed with family and kids, 20% of your wage is your food. So there's a lot of people who've never accessed food provision in the past and it's trying to break down that stigma, which has been really important. And yeah, some of the feedback we've had from people who've received it has been lovely. Um, hard, sometimes, like I've personally broken down because I've delivered an emergency food parcel to someone and a kid came running to the door, like grabbing the food off you and then that just sort of affects you, doesn't it? Um, but it's, you, you do it to make sure that there's sort of more, um, I'm trying to say the word, there's less stigma around it and there's more sort of, you have more control. And obviously in COVID times, we can't get people coming in, which would be the amazing model of like a social supermarket. But to at least give some people some choice does help. And it also depends on how, what, what they cook with. So um, a load of the homeless guys are in hotels. And when you think about it, you can only have a kettle to cook with. There's no microwave, you don't have appliances, you don't have a jug. How on earth do you make a nutritious meal? So you've got to do the best with certain situations. That's what we've been really trying hard to do. Um, and I think we've achieved it. We've obviously started as a, as a response to the crisis in emergency food parcels, um, but we've wanted to sort of develop it so we become a bit more sustainable and also wanting to help people to sort of not just receive free food, but how could we begin to generate ways that they could get food themselves, maybe sell food at a, at a sort of cheaper level. So we work, like I say, in a lot of partnership. And one of our partners is Hool Food Market, which is a local business. They provide fruit and veg, and we've always put fruit and veg into the boxes um, to help people you know, with a balanced diet. So one of our key things that we're really hoping to do is to develop a, a Greenway grocery. So just off the back here, we've got a, a Greenway cycle path. And we're going to get a, a bicycle, uh, an electronic, electrical bicycle, uh, like a green grocery. It will go up and down the Greenway, stop at schools, talk to the particularly families under fives, and then sell fruit and veg at a discounted rate. So be a bit like a community green grocer, um, and and that hopefully subject is getting a bit of funding and and working that through. We'll start up in August, and we'll develop this centre as well to be a bit more holistic where we'll hopefully have a cafe, people can drop in, uh, restrictions hopefully will be lifted, and we'll just build a bit of a community hub physically for people to come and, and yeah, find help and be supported in whatever way they like. Crossroads met people when they didn't know where to turn. They stepped in in one of the darkest and most uncertain times in our lifetime, providing a basic need for people during the pandemic.
and they're not stopping there. To find out more, go to ordinarykindness.co.uk or to donate, go on the Just Giving page and search Ordinary Kindness. It's the sort of the mindset that, okay, maybe you can, maybe you can give one tin of bolognese, but if everybody on your street did that, yeah. how many people could that feed?